couple days have noticed. Uh, we've started to get increase in our media presence, and we ask that you maintain that distancing to help us out. Thank you. Move back. Move back, move on. This has 45 minutes. Oh, from my My cases are in the car. Right, but we can increase the volume. Test, test. All right, for my media affiliates, if it's this loud for the, for the local mic, is that going to disrupt you guys? We're trying to get it to where on the live feed for Twitter, it's loud enough to where the folks at home can hear. Is that going to be all right for you? committed to an incident somewhere in the state of California at this exact moment. Uh, with that, we have 95 aircraft assigned to incidents uh, in California. Those include helicopters and fixed-wing aircrafts. That includes the 747 uh, all the way down to the smaller uh, tankers and helicopters. Uh, in, in that air operations program, across the state, uh, since August 15th, we've dropped 2.4 million gallons of retardant uh, in California on this uh, siege. Uh, an additional 2.5 million gallons of water at the same time. Uh, the, the firefight now includes the California National Guard with 11 helicopters assigned uh, to the lightning siege in the state, uh, as well as 12 specific hand crews, uh, much needed hand crews from the California National Guard, uh, with 216 people assigned to help in that firefight. Right at this moment, we have 60 engines from out of state in California assisting us, and we have an additional 26 engines uh, from other states uh, inbound to California. Uh, and with that, at the same time, other emergencies still go on. Uh, in the past week since this emergency, or these emergencies have started, uh, we have responded as Cal Fire to over 12,500 new emergencies uh, in that same time period. Just wanted to start out and give some context to what's going on in the state before we talk specifically to, uh, to San Mateo Santa Cruz. Tonight here in the, the San Mateo Santa Cruz, uh, lightning complex, we can confirm that we're now up to 74,000 acres that have burned uh, with 8% containment. Additionally, there are still 24,000 structures that are threatened on this fire, uh, and we can confirm an increase in the number of structures that have been destroyed. Uh, 163 structures is where we stand this evening. Uh, that number broken down is 152 structures destroyed in Santa Cruz County and 11 in San Mateo County. Uh, the good news is that we have additional personnel coming in. Uh, we, uh, tonight, this evening, we're up to 1,511 uh, personnel assigned to the incident, and obviously that is very, very helpful. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass it off for an operational briefing from CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, uh, Operations Section Chief Brunton. Good evening. So uh, another very successful day in our uh, firefighting efforts. Uh, the weather has been cooperating with us, even with the adverse weather that's been predicted. Uh, and our troops have uh, gotten with the program and, and really put in a lot of uh, hard work and efforts. So I'll just take you around the map and show you what we've uh, been able to accomplish uh, just uh, for the past couple days with this uh, favorable weather. So around the, the top part in what we call Division uh, Golf and Kilo, we have a, a really good line established there uh, that it helps protect this part for, this top part of the fire for uh, progressing. So that's that's really, really good. We have either cons fully constructed uh, or in the process of constructing and improving a line that, that runs all along the Highway 9 corridor uh, on this part of the fire, the easternmost part of the fire. And so they're making really good progress with that, whether it be everything from our dozer line to our hand crew, hand crew lines all along that area. So uh, that'll be a work in progress over the next couple days. Uh, not only with the initial line, but improving it and putting in what we call contingency or secondary lines uh, for that area to protect those communities, uh, Boulder Creek, Ben Lomond, and uh, Felton itself. 
Along the south, we have our, our, our control line that we established a couple uh, days ago that runs between Highway 1 Highway 9. That's still a good line. We're improving that line and have put in a secondary line behind that. That is being completed as we speak. Should be completed this evening, so that's uh, really good for the community of Santa Cruz and the UC campus. Along the coastline, again, it, uh, the weather's moderated the fire spread. Uh, so community of Danport is still looking really good. We're continuing to uh, work on that, that control line as well, as well as our communities in the north, such as Pescadero. Uh, and uh, interior on uh, the, the community of Bonnie June, we've uh, continued to improve, uh, do uh, spot controls of, of the fire, um, working around the structures, the variety of structures that are in there. And uh, as we get more of the resources, we're able to put more of them to work in that area uh, to in improve in our control efforts. Uh, within uh, the Bonnie Dune community. Uh, speaking next from uh, one of our Unified Incident Command agencies from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office is Chief Deputy Clark. So I wish I had good news for you. I wish I could report on something positive, but I can't. Uh, today, we recovered a decedent, a fire victim, from the area of last chance. Uh, you know, this is something, I don't want to be standing up here, uh, nor does our office want to be recovering people that are victims of fire. Uh, we got in this job to help people. This is a, a very, very dark, I think it's one of the, one of the darkest periods we've, we've been, in, been in with this fire. Uh, John, are we going to press the ring? Okay. So, Today, I, and I want to speak to kind of the effort to recover this decedent. And I, and I really got to, I really have to uh, really give thanks to CAL FIRE in helping us get out there. We, we needed a helicopter literally to get to the area. Stop. Yeah. Sorry for everybody, we'll, uh, we'll get inside somewhere. The rain amazingly has started here in Santa Cruz County, so we'll uh, take a break. All right, we'll try this again. The bad news is our press conference got interrupted and moved. The good news is we're getting precipitation on the fire right now. Uh, again, we'll take it. Uh, we wanted to introduce from the uh, Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office, Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Clark. So as I was saying earlier, um, and you know, kind of ironic, I'm up here telling you that th this is the darkest day in this fire so far, where, I, where I'm, I'm, I'm telling you we, we've recovered a decedent and we get rain. Um, kind of, kind of uh, unbelievable, frankly. Um, and so that, that's what unfortunately happened today uh, at the end of Last Chance Road. Uh, Last Chance, it, heavily fire damaged, impassable, uh, and, and it actually took a helicopter uh, to get our folks in there to recover this person. Sorry. And so unfortunately that was the task uh, that, our office, that our office was involved in uh, throughout the middle, middle portion this afternoon. Uh, it, it, we recovered a 70-year-old man. We've identified this person, but we're waiting on next of kin uh, and notifying them before before I release his release his name. Uh, in terms of other activities for us, it was kind of uh, a little more of the same with uh, a few updates and a few highlights. So, for one, uh, again, touching on burglary suppression, that's we we did that throughout the day. Uh, we did that with a total of 61 staff. Uh, we also conducted a number of welfare checks. Uh, we did 11 of those today, and we responded to 28 suspicious person calls. Uh, but I want to touch on you know, some activity that we had earlier today and kind of give you an idea of really kind of what our deputies are, are, are seeing at, at, at times out there. Now, so this afternoon in, in Felton, our deputies attempted to initiate, uh, did initiate a, a traffic stop of, of, uh, of a vehicle. And uh, it appeared that uh, another vehicle was, was with this other car uh, that we were trying to stop. Either way, we stopped both of them uh, for being in a, in a closed evacuation area. And upon further investigation, we discovered uh, a number of things that were super concerning to us. One, five firearms, including, uh, or six firearms rather, including one assault rifle, 
uh, a bunch of ammunition, a bunch of magazines, uh, stolen property, and drug paraphernalia. So those five people, those five people were arrested and taken to jail, and charged with uh, you know a, a litany of different charges, from weapons violations to drug charges, stolen property, as I mentioned, um, and, uh, and then obviously being in a closed area. Uh, and then some of those folks were permitted out of the area, and so that's kind of what we've been seeing with these folks that we've been contacted who have really no business being here. Either they've been evacuated already uh, and coming back for the purposes of doing harm, or uh, they're from out of the area coming to do the same thing. Uh, we also contacted a person today uh, in, in the evacuated area. We arrested him. He had a warrant. And then uh, we cited somebody else. And again, you know, speaking to this area being closed and our efforts to maintain that closure and, and free up the roads and provide the opportunity for CAL FIRE to fight this fire, that's what we're doing. And so in this case, we cited somebody who they were returning, trying to return back to their home, and we get it. We absolutely get it. But it, it, again, we, you know, having the roads clear for CAL FIRE to be able to do their job is, is, is of utmost importance. And then it also leaves us the ability to be able to, to focus on the people that are out there doing what we don't want them to do. So this person, we, we he ended up receiving a citation for being in a closed evacuation area, and we escorted him out. In terms of missing persons cases, this decedent uh, that we recovered was one of uh, the missing persons cases I've reported to you earlier. Uh, that was one of the two. We, uh, we have three more today, and we'll be vetting those and, and going through them. Like I said, we, we have detectives that are committed to going through these cases until we're absolutely certain where these people are. So today, we, we, uh, that list grew to three. Um, in terms of cell phones, so in terms of cell phones, so for those people that are choosing to remain in their homes, uh, you know, we encourage you to evacuate. You just don't know what the weather's going to do. Granted, we got rain right now, which is a great thing. But if, if something changes, the wind changes or what have you, it leads to a rescue, and obviously it, it divides our resources. Uh, but if you're going to stay in the evacuated area, I want you to know that cell service is extremely sporadic, I mean, throughout the valley. And so if you needed help, if, you know, if we have to reach out to you because of reverse 911, or we have to somehow, or if your family needs to get in touch with you, they're not going to have that opportunity because cell service is down right now. Now granted, Verizon is working on that, so they're working on that today. Hopefully they'll be able to fix it. But if something else changes, that might not happen. And then AT&T, if you have that service, they're working on it tomorrow. That could take some time. I say that because if you needed help tonight, you might not be able to make a phone call. So it's important to be able to heed the evacuation warning and leave those evacuation areas. Uh, I want to touch on scams. I touched on that this morning. So again, it's unfortunate there's people out there that are, that are looking to take advantage uh, of you if you've evacuated. And so uh, these scams are going to continue. Uh, and so you might get a phone call. I mentioned it this morning if you didn't hear. But you may get a phone call. It could be somebody claiming to be from PG&E. It could be somebody saying that, hey, it's, you know, we're here to, to, to fix your gas line or whatever. And, and, they, may, and, and they may tell you, that's going to cost a, an amount of money and we'll be there. And, and then there's this gift card angle. There's a whole lot of different angles these folks use to be able to ruse people into giving them money. And so unfortunately, it happens. Uh, you know, in other, in other times I've seen people unfortunately lose, you know, thousands of dollars to these folks. So please, if you get a phone call from a, util from a utility company or, or someone that says they're with us, nobody's going to ask you for money over the phone. And definitely nobody's going to ask you for gift cards over the phone. That's typically what, how these things work. On somewhat of a positive note, uh, the county has developed a free hotel program. And so I want to I wanna be able to direct people because I, uh, because frankly, we, you know, we can, we can empathize that in a time like we're in today with COVID and everything else that's going on, you know, having resources for people to utilize to be able to find a place to sleep uh, is vitally important. And, 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 and frankly, we know people are hurting. So here's a resource for people if they're looking for free, for free lodging. It's, and, it's, and I've mentioned this website, I believe, last night, santacruzcounty.us forward slash fire resources. That's uh, santacruzcounty.us forward slash fire resources. And uh, they developed this not only, the county of Santa Cruz developed this not only with the thought in mind that people needed a place to sleep, but also recognizing that sleeping outside just isn't healthy in a, in a fire environment. I mean, uh, it's, it's extremely smoky throughout the county. And so sleeping outside just may not be good for people's health. So if you need free housing, and definitely, we, you know, it, it's healthier to sleep indoors than it is outside, look at that website. And then lastly, uh, the city of Watsonville has set up a community donation center, and that's at 114 Walker Street in the city of Watsonville. So that's 114 Walker Street uh, in Watsonville, and that donation center is open Monday to Friday, uh, 8 to 8, for folks who, uh, who want to donate uh, supplies, 
and other things for people that have been displaced. Thank you. Uh, speaking next from the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office is Detective Blanksway. For San Mateo County, we are seeing some scams popping up of people claiming to be fire victims. They've lost their houses or they need some kind of funding to assist them with uh, recovering from this. We ask that you do your due diligence to look into whether or not these scams are real. One of the scams we saw, this person had already raised $22,000. So do what you can to try to uh, vet these GoFundMe accounts and do the best you can to save your hard-earned money. Um, any changes that we have in weather or conditions for the San Mateo County and coastline, we'll update you through our social media platforms as well as SMC Alert and the Sheriff's app. That's all we have. Thank you. Speaking next from CAL FIRE Incident Management Team 3, Incident Commander Billy C. Hey, good evening. Um, obviously, it's been a tragic day. Uh, finding a, a civilian fatality out there on any incident is tragic. And, you know, on behalf of Team 3 and Cal Fire and all the cooperating agencies, you know, our, our condolences out to the uh, family of the deceased. Today was a good day on the uh, fire line. The uh, weather's been moderated for us. Uh, the humidities have come up and has allowed the firefighting personnel out on the ground to make significant headway in developing containment lines around this incident. Over the next few hours, we anticipate additional personnel uh, showing up on the incident, along with additional engines, which will bolster our firefighting force on the ground tomorrow. Obviously, we're still under a red flag warning. It's been decreased until uh, 5 p.m. tomorrow night. And we have moisture coming in right now, which will benefit the uh, firefighting effort on the ground. But we'll watch closely throughout the night and into tomorrow to see if we have any lightning activity with it. As we continue throughout the week, uh, the weather pattern is going to diminish. And what the predictions right now will remain that the uh, humidity levels will come up. The recovery at night will increase, which will allow our firefighting personnel to gain significant headway as long as we don't have any significant winds with the weather pattern. So to close, like I said, our hearts go out to uh, the families deceased, and the firefighters will continue to put their best foot forward to uh, contain this incident in front of us. Thank you. And our final speaker, CAL FIRE, San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit, Unit Chief Larkin. Good evening. Uh, I just want to reiterate and uh, state that, uh, yes, our condolences go out to the family of the uh, a citizen that lost his life in this fire. Um, it's just a stark reminder of those that still remain in the area that uh, this fire has become deadly. And I just want to reiterate to those that are still out in the communities that we have a weather pattern coming in that's unpredictable. We are seeing a little bit of moisture with it, but we don't know how much moisture we're going to get. We do not know if we're going to get lightning or not. We don't know what the wind speeds are actually going to be in and around the fire. This still has potential to be a devastating uh, situation for those that remain in that fire area. I had an opportunity today to go out on the line and just view a little bit more of the fire area. And uh, it's pretty devastating the amount of uh, uh, destruction that has occurred, uh, not only in our watershed, but to the residents uh, in the communities uh, here in Santa Cruz County. Um, it's just a stark reminder of where we live. We live in the mountains, we live in the rural areas, and uh, though it hasn't happened here ever, um, it has happened here now. So uh, moving forward, uh, the troops are doing a great job out there, uh, making progress with the resources that we have at scene. And as we continue to get new resources in, uh, the team will be doing the allocation to make sure those resources are put in there uh, in the most uh, uh, advantageous way to uh, get the production that we need to get this fire under uh, control. Thank you. And just a few items to note before we take any questions. Uh, a few questions have come up about the damage inspection process. Uh, we have, there's 12 damage inspection teams out there now looking at the damaged and destroyed structures. They are being uh, hindered by all of the trees that are down in the roadway, all of the kind of uh, poles that are down, the wires on the ground. 
Uh, so it's just taking time to get in those deep canyons, uh, some of which are still smoldering and hot and, uh, and still have fire in them. So there will be increases in those numbers. It's just uh, going to take some time for our, our damage inspection teams to get in there. Um, with that, uh, a couple other questions that have come up recently are in regards to infrastructure and the watershed. Um, the CAL FIRE uh, incident management teams work with what's called a watershed emergency response team or a WERT uh, to address the kind of impact on the watersheds um, uh, such as the, the, the watershed here in, the, in the, this fire essentially. Uh, so those are two things that I think are important to note uh, because they do come up uh, often in the questions. With that, happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, yesterday you talked about the National Guard. So where are they as far as training is concerned and when will they be able to actually be out there helping in the firefighting effort? Yes, yeah, so the question is related to where is the National Guard and when will they be here at the fire themselves? And I'll pass that over to Chief C. Currently the National Guard's been activated for another training down in the San Luis unit right now. They do a five day training period. Uh, we anticipate that training and being going out on the line around the 26, 27. Uh, they'll be deployed uh, based on the uh, need of incidents uh, throughout the state of California. Do you have specific numbers of how many will come from this fire? Not at this point, no. Uh, we'll, uh, that'll be determined uh, once they become available after the training uh, period is complete. Yeah. We get more information on the death of the seven-year-old. You said he was missing a few days ago, and now he's. Sure. The question was related to the uh, the, the fatality that's been confirmed, and any further information about that. I'll pass it over to the sheriff's office. Yeah. So you know, we we take missing persons cases, and we've taken a few uh, during the course of this fire. That this missing person, or this this person that lost their life. Um, it was reported to us this person was missing, and so through our detectives' efforts to locate him, as well as people in and around the area um, alerting us to basically what, what potentially was, appeared to be uh, human remains is, is what got us to that area. Um, and I want to talk to that for a minute. These, we want to get to these areas. We, we want to um, find these people. We, we do. And so, unfortunately, in this case, uh, it took a helicopter to get there. And so... And not only that, but changing conditions and fire and, and just all the hazards that, that come with that. Um, it, it took us some time to get there, but we got there. And so and today, uh, we were able to bring that person uh, back here to, uh, to Sanders. When was that person who was missing again? Uh, early on in the fire. I want to say it was like either Tuesday or Wednesday. Was he found at his home or on his property? No. So uh, he was found uh, kind of towards the end of Last Chance Road. And so uh, some distance from what we think potentially uh, is this person's car. And again, I'd like to tell you who the person is. We just haven't spoken to their family. And obviously out of respect for that and, and their loss, we want to uh, make sure that we honor that. And uh, yeah, there'll be more information on, with that as, uh, as we go along. Any idea if he was one of the people trying to stay, stay behind and try to the fire? Or did he not get the situation? Uh, that's something we're working through. And so obviously it's contacting people and speaking to people that were in and around that area and getting the statements from them. And, and trying to help us answer what, what exactly was this person doing. Uh, I mean, likely they may have been trying to escape that fire, uh, just speaking plainly. Uh, but those are all questions that we have, uh, things that we're working through, and uh, answers that we want to give uh, the family when we notify them. How many more missing persons are there right now? So right now we have four additional cases. And again, like I said, we've been working with, we've been working through, uh, up until today we only had two. So we had this person that we found, and then we had one more. Uh, that case, uh, one of our earlier cases, we were hoping to get up there uh, and, and do further investigation uh, today. Uh, I don't have any other information on that. And then we developed three more today. And again, our detectives are, are in the middle of gathering more information, trying to get to those areas. Uh, this is a few days ago now, but on Wednesday, someone asked how, how the evacuations on Last Chance Road were handled and how the Sheriff's Office would handle evacuations in the future. And uh, since uh, and you mentioned that it gets to the heart of your uh, the sheriff's office's relationship with Cal Fire. Um, since then, of course, everyone's been really proactive about about doing evacuations. But um, how has Cal Fire been in terms of communicating with your office and your colleagues? Um, and uh, is there anything they can do better? Are there any hiccups in those initial days? 
No. I mean, we, we were locked with Cal Fire, uh, and I couldn't speak high, more, more highly of the job they're doing uh, with the resources that they have. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I was at my office uh, on Tuesday when I got a call, there was a fire in Boulder Creek. And so me and my, my management team, we responded directly to the Cal Fire headquarters. And that's where I met up with uh, Chief Larkin, and we, we began working uh, this crisis together. So, and we've been tied uh, in that relationship ever since. We're co-located here at, at base camp. And so uh, our folks are working, I mean, hour by hour with Cal Fire. Yes, ma'am. We saw, it's actually a question from yep. Cal Fire, but we saw some planes uh, near Boulder Creek, and I'm just wondering, what's the strategy tonight to protect that community? So the question is, what is the strategy to protect Boulder Creek tonight? Correct. And uh, Chief uh, Brunt will be able to answer that. So yeah, the, the fire is still actively burning. So you, there are gonna be flames visible, um, especially certain vantage points, especially as the fire progresses, albeit slowly, um, and, and people will see some flames. So uh, yeah, what we have, as I explained earlier, we have uh, control lines that we've been working on and we're in the process of establishing. We have uh, crews that are working uh, that area. And um, yeah, it's, it's gonna be something that's an ongoing effort and, and, and you know, fire isn't fully controlled by any stretch, so that, that will occur, especially now that the smoke has lifted due to the weather conditions. They are going to be more visible as before the smoke really was hiding uh, those flames. But uh, I can assure you that the crews are working diligently at uh, suppressing that and, and, and quite honestly have done a fantastic job in, in uh, constructing the amount of control line in such a small period of time with limited resources and very adverse conditions with heavy fuels and very steep topography. Uh, and so I have a question. It still is called the CCU, uh, like complex fire, of course, but it sounds like it's basically just one fire at this point, a couple of um, spot fires around the perimeter. Is, is that the case, or, or is it, is, are there still a variety of fires in there? Correct. So the question regards uh, to it was a complex of fires but we have one large fire now. So yes, it did start out as a complex of fires, a number of small fires, all created by the lightning uh, event that, that occurred earlier in the week. As the, those small fires grew, they all grew together into one large fire. There are, as you can see on the map, uh, some of the circles with the X's. Those were some of the other additional lightning fires that occurred, but uh, were suppressed and are in a patrol uh, mode right now. So we check on those on a regular basis to make sure that there's no flare-ups. Uh, mop those up, and then eventually put those uh, into a control status, which means that they're completely and fully uh, out. So, uh, yeah, what you see now is, is a, we're a bunch of fires that rapidly grew together into one big fire. And that typically happens with these complexes, which you're seeing in, in uh, further North Bay and over in the East Bay with those fires, same thing. They were all a bunch of uh, very small fires that have grown all together into one large event. The largest challenge that we faced, well, uh, we've been saying time and again the limited resources. Uh, typically, on, on most of our wildland fire events uh, throughout the state and most fire seasons, we'll have one or a couple large fires occurring at the same time. But we still have a lot of res uh, resources available to us. California is very fortunate. We're a very, very unique state in the fact, in emergency response, that we have a very uh, good mutual aid system. So we work very closely, not only with CAL FIRE, but with our federal and local government partners, uh, as well as our law enforcement partners, working harmoniously to, to take care of these events. So what happened here was it's such a widespread event with a variety of fires that are ongoing, limited resources, and then where most of these lightning fires occur, they're not in very easy terrain to, for us to fight fire in. So it makes it a challenge for us with the limited resources to work in very inhospitable terrain for the most part in heavy fuel loadings to, to be successful with our, our strategy and tactics. And that is probably the, all combined the, the biggest challenge we're facing right now. Uh, I could address that, sure. So, what we saw early in the event, obviously the lightning event went through. Then what we saw on the, the back side of that was a weather event in which uh, we had a significant north wind event which pushed the ignited uh, vegetation and created the large fire that we have uh, now. We saw that over a period of time. So with those winds, 
the relative humidity is plummeting, uh, which the drier the air mass, the drier the fuels, and, and in more intensity with our fires. As the week progressed and towards the end of the week, we saw some of those mitigate. We saw the winds decrease. Our relative humidities weren't as low as they were. And that gave us an opportunity to really jump in on the fire and, and, and employ our strategy and tactics with some success. Then we have the event as we're facing now where we're seeing the breakup of a, of a previous hurricane. It creates a lot of moisture and conditions that uh, lend themselves to potential for dry lightning. And, and strong outflow winds that we call them, which push the fire many different directions. We don't have a very directional wind pattern with these, so it's very unpredictable and very dangerous for our crews. As we progress through this uh, event, uh, we'll see what actually happens. Uh, we really didn't have a prediction of any sort of precipitation. We saw a little bit right now. Is it enough to put out this fire? I don't want to give any false hope. No. The fuels are so dry. Is it going to give us a little bit of help? Absolutely. As we move through the rest of the weekend and into the next week, the forecasts are very favorable with a little bit higher relative humidities, light winds, uh, temperatures a little bit above average, but it's stuff that we face in a normal summer day throughout the state of California and suppressing wildland fires. So it, it's stuff that we're used to working in as far as the environment and regarding the weather and the fuels conditions, although albeit dry. And I think and I believe that this week we're gonna have a lot of good progress uh, if we get once we get past this weather event here this weekend, uh, it should set us up well, especially as we get more resources, which we've been seeing. And I think we're going to have a lot of good success this coming week. Uh, you'll you'll see as we progress through the week, um, more winds for the big wind to put this thing completely to bed. What's potentially more? What's potentially more concerning? Dry starting to meet fire in a different area, or just the erratic wind, you know, blowing the front fire? So the question regarding what's worse, if the, the, the new starts from the lightning or the winds. Really with the new starts, um, it, it's, it's a bit of a uh, uh, roll of the dice as far as will these start something, ignite something on a magnitude, uh, was there wind directly behind it that'll, that'll make that small fire into something bigger. Uh, we have plans that we put together uh, with this event that we knew we were going to face that we would attack those small fires. We, we have contingency plans. Keep those small, isolate those, and then it's not as big of a problem for us. But when you have a fire this large, when we don't have as many control lines in place that we would typically or like to have at this point in time within this event, then certainly these outflow winds, these erratic winds, which are very unpredictable, uh, especially with this topography and the dry fuels, that's more concerning to, to myself, to my other fire ground commanders, as well as uh, our personnel out in the line. So I would say out of the, the two, the, the win is, is the bigger issue. What do you think of the people staying behind in the evac zones? Uh, there's a group in Bonny Dune, for instance, that claims they saved 20 homes. Uh, what's your thoughts on this, these people? That's a bit of a, you know, a challenge in the fact that, um, you know, for people that are the property owners, I, I understand, I get it. I've personally been through events where uh, my home or my family's home was threatened by fire and, and Obviously, you want to do what you can to protect your property, and, and we understand that. We invoke the, um, the fact that we evacuate the people, and we've said it time and again, the main reason is so that, number one, their safety is first and foremost. Um, no offense to anybody, but most are not trained professional firefighters, and although they think they are doing the right thing and they're doing a good thing, they inadvertently put themselves into harm's way. And when we're in there, whether it be ourselves uh, as firefighters doing fire suppression or our brothers and sisters in law enforcement that are doing their job to isolate that area and to make it safe, um, it, it puts us in a really disadvantageous position when we have to go and perform a rescue for somebody that inadvertently gets themselves in a bad spot. Um, you know, for, for those people that have stayed behind, uh, it, it has created some challenges for us, um, some um, innocently and some where as We've reported where they've taken advantage uh, on criminal activity and nefarious actions. So um, overall, I would say that, uh, like we've said time and again, I know they want to do the right thing. They want to protect their property, understand that right. But uh, in the big, the big picture, uh, it's, it's safer to have us that are professionals um, go in there, take care of that, protect their lives, protect their property, and, uh, and end this uh, event. 
But the, but you know, we also be talking about how strapped crews are and how you need more resources in those first few days. Did it help at all to have? Was it was it was it all more complicated? Was there any benefits to having those crews on the ground? Yeah, I think we're happy to chat with you further. Um, we're, we'll take individual questions after this. I just want to close this out by saying, uh, although there's a team up here of, and a, a, a group of unified incident commanders, there's a whole bunch of people that are not acknowledged and that we really want to say thank you to. And that is all the people who are working at the shelters right now, all those non-profit uh, organizations that are helping people uh, get their animals out and keeping them safe. And I think that uh, requires a lot of acknowledgement and from, from our team especially, thank you for assisting us in being successful. With that, thank you to the media. That's the fastest I've ever seen a press conference be scrambled and reset up. I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, we'll see you here again tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. This concludes the press conference. Thank you.